Hello, 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 hello. Hello, welcome to the second uh, Noisy Thinking of 2018. If you missed last time, you missed Jim Carroll giving anecdotes that range from the Cassandra complex to street fighting um, and Martin Beverly giving away brilliant secrets, top 10 secrets of how to sell ideas. It's all online, so go back and watch it again. But thank you for coming for this time round. Thank you again, as normal, to Google for hosting such a lovely venue and, and the hospitality and to Flamingo, who sponsor the noisy thinking. If you don't know Flamingo, they're a global strategic insight consultancy who specialize in cultural understanding. They're awesome, they're great. They've left some, some postcards with their contact details. If you haven't worked with them, give them a call. Uh, the, the title for tonight, I don't know whether it's going to come up. It's a scary one. If the structure of our industry is broken, what do strategists do next? And it is definitely a hotly debated topic, um, a very live, hotly debated issue. Some might say an existential problem facing our industry our specialism, but broader business and economy, uh, uh, as no doubt, as the big incumbent legacy organisations are wrestling with the disruptive, modern, fluid, agile culture, and probably in the case of something like Brexit, desperately holding on to a bygone era that maybe didn't exist in the first place. So the innovator's dilemma is alive and well, but the critical bit, and I'm pointing to all the panellists, as I say, this is what do strategists do next? We hope this won't just be a discussion and endless debate about the challenges facing us, but actually some practical solutions, ideas and problems. So I'm going to do my best to hold these guys to that and I would ask you to join me in doing that too through your questions. The second thing I guess I would promise is whilst the structure of our industry may be broken, I would hope and believe that the talent and skill set that we have in this room as strategists is far from broken. If anything, the onus is on the structure and the organisations to change the model, the process, break the dogma that hold us back because the strategic skill set and value that we have as strategists and planners is ever more important and the need to set us free and allow us to collaborate more thoroughly and enjoyably and, 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 and fulfill, in a fulfilling way has never been more important. And just to give a sense of what, why I believe what we have will endure and has never been more important. Has everyone read Kevin Kelly, The Inevitable, which is a fantastic book and thought piece on understanding the 12 technological forces that shape our future. If you haven't read it, watch it. It's about an hour long South by talk and many podcasts. But his 12th, which I think is most powerful for us and thinking about as we move forward into the future, is questioning. He says, a good question is worth a million good answers. A good question is not concerned with a correct answer. A good question cannot be answered immediately. A good question challenges existing answers. A good question is one you badly want answered once you hear it, but had no inkling you cared before it was asked. A good question creates new territory of thinking. A good question reframes its own answers. A good question is the seed of innovation in science, technology, art, politics, and business. A good question is a probe, a what-if scenario. A good question skirts on the edge of what is known and not known, neither silly nor obvious. A good question cannot be predicted. A good question will be the sign of an educated mind. A good question is one that generates many other good questions. A good question may be the last job a machine will learn to do. A good question is what humans are for. A good question is arguably what strategists are for. And hopefully in the future, you keep asking questions, we'll all be all right. And tonight, please keep asking questions and hold these guys to the promise of ideas and solutions. So the speakers we have tonight are Guy Murphy, uh, incredible planner, started his career at one of the top homes of planning BMP and then at uh, JWT where he heads it up the planning there as the global CSO in charge of worldwide planning. He also got a bit of time in at BBH doing some of their most famous work, a classic planning career. He's won APG awards, Battle of the Big Thinking and has an interesting perspective on the industry at the heart of one of the biggest agencies and holding companies. Um, next up will be Sally Weaver, started her career at JWC as a media planner in the days when media thinkers were alongside creative planners, subsequently worked in a variety of different media organisations as a strategist and became MD of Initiative Media. She's topped this impressive CV by founding very recently Craft Media, a specialist comms strategy unit which launched only a couple of weeks ago. Uh, next up will be Stu Smith, who started, and I found out this tonight, and this is fascinating, started his career as a statistician in the Ministry for Agriculture, Fishers and Food, but jumped ship to planning, uh, headed up strategy at Widens, been here at uh, Google and Creative Lab, and has uh, obviously is hugely successful, Anomaly London, uh, APG Gold for Cancer Research, and the Obesity Ad, was that your, was yours, I take it as well, which caused a hot debate, which has been fantastic. And then lastly, but not least, Ian Leslie, who also started at JWT, not, uh, not an intentional theme, passing successfully through YNR, Chai Day, Channel 5 as head of brand, um, and whether this experience 
got him moving on from the industry, but has worked as a freelance communication strategist for 10 years, has written massively in the FT, working directly with clients as well, and he's going to give us a point of view on the perspective from writing and writers. So it should be a brilliant evening. I'm going to hand over first to Guy. Um, welcome to the stage. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good stuff. Good stuff. So, good evening, everybody. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah just about. Um, so we've already got uh, 10 minutes each to speak. Uh, so let's, let's dive straight in. Um, so to that question, uh, if the structure of our industry is broken, uh, what do strategists do next? Um, and uh, I think there are only three possible answers you can give to that question. Uh, one is help fix the industry. Two is leave the industry. Uh, and three is, uh, don't leave the industry, but don't help fix it. Um, and th th that third option might sound a bit odd, doesn't it? Um, but I suspect it might be the most common. Uh, because I think it, it's easy to imagine that fixing the industry is something that other people do. We do our jobs, and then there are these sort of industry leaders that go about industry fixing. And they're, they're captains of industry, and they head up our groups. And that's what they do, and it's nothing to do with what we do. So I suspect a lot of people um, have that answer and probably feel a bit, a bit stuck. Um, uh, and so I guess I'm sort of aiming my chat mostly at the people who feel they want to stay in our industry. They, they don't really know how to fix it, so what, what can be done? Um, and the way I'd like to suggest it is we look at, we look at the issue slightly differently. Uh, and we see the industry actually as a, as a sum total of everything that we all do. So the industry is nothing more than the collection of all the decisions that we make, um, all the actions that we go about, uh, and all the, the processes that we decide to follow or not follow. That is the industry. Um, so, so it is possible to influence it because it is only us. There is something else going on called the industry, and then there's us doing our day jobs. So they're one and the same, and we all comprise the industry. So what we do is the industry. Uh, so actually, there's a very direct connection people can make between what they do uh, and this potentially broken uh, industry that we're in. So uh, let's just quickly remind ourselves of what is, uh, what is broken. Uh, and I wanted to start the story um, with a couple of articles. One of the benefits of being an industry that's a bit challenged uh, is everyone loves to write about it. Everyone likes a bit of bad news. So there's tons of articles, and you can read a lot. Um, so two, two articles. It doesn't matter that you haven't read them. Um, and I've got them here. Um, why, why am I showing you these? Well, um, let me tell you about them. Uh, this one here uh, on the left-hand side, um, this is done by uh, high-profile management consultants at Harvard Business School. Uh, and so is this one. Uh, it's also done by McKinsey's. Uh, uh, this one uses uh, a lot of original research, uh, thousands of consumers and respondents asking about hundreds of brands. And so does this one. Uh, this one did its work in 2017, and uh, so did this one. Uh, why am I laboring the similarities between these two uh, reports? Uh, because despite all that and these two highly credible sources, they came to two completely different conclusions about what's the best way to grow business these days. Um, so Harvard said uh, the right answer is um, businesses must focus on uh, the kind of downstream post-purchase uh, area of the buying decision, focus on user experience. Uh, the McKinsey's report focused uh, on the upstream part of the buying process, uh, pre-buying uh, brand consideration. So quite Byron Sharpie, we're both familiar with these positions. It doesn't really matter what they are. The point is they're completely different uh, from two sets of incredibly experienced uh, business uh, observers. And, and the point is not really to bait what the right answer is, it's, uh, it's to recognize that it, even some of the cleverest people with research uh, end up with a, a different view and they don't agree. Uh, and you see similar sort of disagreement, don't you, in our industry, it's not just the consultants. You see that debate happening in rooms like this uh, or in our trade press and um, it's quite rare to see people really uh, agreeing. 
So um, what's a planner to think? I mean, how are you supposed to advise your clients uh, when uh, it's not quite clear what is the right kind of advice uh, to be giving them? Uh, but maybe more important is, uh, what's a client to think? Uh, because if our industry is struggling to find out what's the right model to work from, uh, why should they uh, be paying us? Because we're guessing. Um, and uh, I, I don't know if you saw last, was it last Friday, Mark Pritchard, uh, P&G, global brand executive, uh, had a pretty harsh speech to make about our industry. I think he was in an exceedingly bad mood. Um, this is my Mark Pritchard emojis. Um, and so he spoke, I mean, familiar themes, but you know, tough stuff. He spoke about, um, again, cutting agency roster by thousands of agencies, uh, cutting production spends, uh, complaining we have too many overheads, not enough transparency, especially in digital media, uh, not enough creative people, uh, his view is we should be at least kind of 70% headcount in some form of imagination in all our different kind of companies. Uh, and that media and creative uh, is, is ridiculous to be uh, a part. Uh, tough stuff. But here's the kicker. Uh, he talked about a very determined strategy where P&G will start doing a lot more agency services in-house. Now, we've heard this before, but let's, let's think about that for a moment, taking it in-house. So we, we work for agencies. We are agents of clients. So we're an intermediary between them and media or them and the entertainment industry or the tech industry or the culture industry, however you'd like to think about it. And, and our existence, the only reason we'd get paid, is if we can do something better than the clients think they can do it themselves. And then it's worth outsourcing to us. And the moment they start thinking they can in-house it, it's because they've begun to lose some belief uh, in our ability to do it better than them. So this extreme, extremely significant moment when clients are starting to talk about that. Uh, and to add uh, insult to injury, uh, he used the phrase, uh, taking back control. Um, and uh, you, you know you're in trouble when clients are describing your industry using the Boris Johnson Brexit phrase book. <laughs> Um, but, but I'm not picking on Mr. Pritchard at all. You've heard pretty similar refrains, haven't you, from, uh, from Unilever and many, many uh, other clients. But when, when the industry's two biggest clients uh, are telling the industry what it needs to do, we've somehow lost control of the narrative, uh, which is in part because we're not quite sure what the right narrative uh, is. And this point of narrative is, is important. Um, so what's a planner to do? Uh, What's a client to do? But what's an investor to do? Um, and the answer appears to be sell. Um, you've seen these in the press, nothing new here. This is the uh, stock price of the major ad groups uh, indexed back in time. Um, uh, and you can see things start falling off a cliff around about the middle of last year. Uh, and I've always liked that quote that says some um, the future uh, happens very slowly and then all at once. Uh, and it does feel a bit like that in our industry, doesn't it? The future has been happening for an extremely long time uh, and then it happened, uh, which is kind of a bit what that graph actually looks like with that big fall there at the beginning of last year. Now, there's a debate, of course, is this, um, is this cyclical uh, or is this structural? Um, and it's probably true to say that marketing spend is going to come back probably middle of this year, as it always does when there's a World Cup. Probably reasonable to assume some of the growth markets are going to come back a little bit. You know, certainly India after a terrible 2017. But, but no doubt there are some disruptions going on uh, and some changes that are going to continue to uh, not help. So that's the, that's the kind of broken bit. And this is familiar stuff. Um, but let's have a look at the, the fixing bit. Uh, and let's take a look at what people are up to uh, to try and get over this. Uh, and we can begin to get a view of what planners can do here. And, and I've just tried to um, gather together what I think are the, the strategies that are being employed. Uh, so I've, I've got five. Uh, there may be less or maybe more, um, but we'll take five for the moment. Uh, and I'm going to do these really fast. Um, 
and, and I'd like you, as I go through them, please, to um, decide on your favourite. So which one do you think, if you had to vote for it, um, which one would you choose to make the biggest difference to some of the things that we've mentioned? So I'll do these, I'll do these really quickly, because um, you, you'll know them. So the, the point is more the view on it than what they are. Uh, so consolidation, uh, you know, familiar term, you know, pu putting together previously separate units of capability uh, and putting them in, in one, so you can gather all the very best talent uh, together, create a leaner, faster, more agile organization uh, that could be faster for clients uh, and have a better specialisms. Um, again, lots of people doing that, but you see WPP doing that, putting together uh, the, all their PR agencies, putting together all their consultancies, and of course, uh, WPP have done it with, uh, with research as well. So cl clear stuff. Secondly, uh, simplification. So uh, let's remove that complexity that exists, which can be structural, can be financial, uh, can be in uh, process and how things work. Let's streamline that, streamline that, because clients need to use a lot of different services. Let's make that easy, make it faster. Uh, and I guess much of that dialogue has come from Publicis, hasn't it, with the creation of Publicis One. You know, one P&L, no silos, simplification is uh, what they're talking a lot about. Uh, number three, diversification. So uh, simply adding capability that's different to the capability that a company has already. Uh, and mostly that's because people are trying to be able to build their capability along the consumer journey and access different pots of money. Uh, and also because clients increasingly are looking for slightly more end-to-end -end solutions. Um, I mean, the examples here is, I mean, almost every agency in the world, pr pretty much. So I don't think anyone kind of owns this, but you know, everyone's trying to add data. Uh, everyone's trying to add tech. Uh, uh, everyone's adding content. Tech's adding content. Um, agency's adding consultancy. Uh, data trying to add creativity. So everyone's trying to add a bit more on. Uh, number four, specialization. Um, so it, it is what it says. You know, let, let's do one thing really, really well. Uh, and not try and join it all up, but be fantastic at that thing, to be the go-to player uh, in, in one area. And, and you see this perhaps most in the, in the slightly more technical spaces. Uh, so again, in, in data uh, and uh, analytics, you see it in production uh, with Hogarth. Hogarth, there's a lot of decoupling of production from agencies. So production as a speciality. Um, I met a company the other day who were in um, they were in ethical programmatic platforms only. Um, so, you know, there is hyper specialization. Um, and I don't know whether um, Adam and Eve meant, meant this when they talked about they were going to do culture, not collateral. There's a sort of decision there of what they're not going to do. Um, uh, finally, vertical integration. So, um, you know, this is, this is where you, you, you move across the supply chain up, up or down. Um, in whichever way you fancy. And uh, so you, you can go up, as you see people doing, into probably more the kind of business consultancy space. Uh, so agencies doing that. It's actually coming the other way more as consultants are vertically integrating down. Um, but pa perhaps slightly more interesting and unusual is, um, uh, is vertically integrating in into media owners or, or kind of culture owners, or whatever you want to call it. Uh, and so that's where you see uh, Havas uh, being bought by Vivendi, uh, and that, that play there. Uh, obviously, it helps that the, 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 son of, the son of the CEO of Vivendi is the CEO of um, Havas. Uh, so so fi five strategies going on. Um, uh, so uh, by show of hands, um, who votes for number one? For those who can't see, that's nobody. Uh, number two, simplification. Yeah, there's a bit of appetite for making things a bit less complex, but it's a meagre showing, fair to say. Uh, diversification, adding more services. Yeah, couple, a couple of people. Uh, so simplification is probably still winning. There's a lot of hands to go up. Where are they going to go? Specialization. Yeah, I think this is the winner so far. So this is doing, we're going to one thing really well and we're going to just be fantastic at that. Okay, is anyone, is anyone going to beat that? 
Uh, so vertical integration. Okay. Not so many. I think, uh, I think specialism wins. Wow, in a world of integration and end-to-end -end consumer journeys, <laughs> we, most of us believe the right answer is just do one thing. <laughs> OK. Um, so I mean, I, the, the point is not so much uh, what people voted for. Uh, the, the idea of having that vote was to sort of uh, suggest uh, get involved, um, which is my, my main point. Um, get, get involved in that question. Uh, to, to where I began, because it's not the question for other people. Um, and, and don't be the, the type who wants to stay in the industry and not try and fix it. Um, and try to answer it in how you spend your day uh, and how, uh, how you decide to go about your work. Um, because I think we have to think of our job as a microcosm of the industry. Um, and we need to innovate uh, as much in how we work uh, as what we produce. Our creativity is in the, the way we go about what we do, uh, not just what we end up uh, creating at, at the end. Um, so so um, never, never work the same way twice, if you can. Um, find other people in other agencies um, who, are, who have a similar mindset and see what you can hook up and do with those people. Uh, don't ask permission from anybody um, you're in a, we're all in a creative business. This is not a permission uh, business. Um, and I don't think any, anyone should feel as though anyone is working anywhere where trying new things is anything other than highly encouraged. Uh, and just finally, if you've done all that, and only if you've done all that, and you still want to leave the industry, that's OK. Uh, but not before you've tried. And that's my 10 minutes. Thank you. Thank, you, Thank you. Hello. Um, you won't have heard of Craft. We're pretty new. Uh, and the, the very important first question is, do you like my new logo? Because this is its first outing. Work with me and you get all of your media plans in a nice cross stitch. Um, <laughs> oh. <laughs> Or at the very least, I can hem your curtains brilliantly. Anyway, that's my, that's my new logo. Um, I spent four months last year off not working, which I recommend, um, uh, if you can do that. And I spent some time talking to, oh, it's my, my turn to turn the thing. I spent loads of time talking to clients, um, strategists, media strategists and creative agencies, trying to work out what the real problem was with the media industry. Um, and whilst the big public debate, as you will all have read, is around transparency, um, it became really clear to me that the, the big issue um, was more about strategy. Um, and clients were uh, pretty consistent when they said that they felt that strategy had been downgraded within the, the media uh, operations to the point where they no longer felt its presence um, and were even considering taking comm strategy out of house and we uh, um, back in house rather and they, we saw that happen for the first time in November last year when Deutsche Telekom took comm strategy back in house globally so downgrading their relationship with WPP. Uh, so it was starting to happen. They basically felt that the, the strategies that they were appro um, approving weren't always 100% in their interest. Um, and they also worried that they were seeing the top, uh, or they weren't seeing the top strategic talent from agencies. In fact, most of them said, you know, we saw a really great planner at the pitch. Never again. That was it. Never again saw that planner. And seemingly that was the problem with strategists. So, so my peers um, basically complaining that all that happened was that they were used to pitch endlessly, one pitch to another. And with a pitch strike rate in media of one in eight, you can see how that might uh, start them feeling pretty undervalued and overworked. And, and media pitches are invariably not one because of a great strategy. Uh, it's more likely down to a commercial deal or a handshake further up the chain. And after a while, that really starts to impact your own self-worth. Um, 
so linked to this, I think, is the fact that good strategists are the most senior people in the business. Um, they cost a lot, to be frank. Um, and that's why there aren't very many of them. Uh, and so they're really, really, really stretched. Uh, they're really stretched thin. They put, at best, fingerprints over projects um, rather than getting fully involved. And if you've ever worked with a good com, com strategist, you'll know that we're absolutely at our best when we are fully involved in a project, fully immersed in it. Um, and at the same time, the, the creative agencies that I spoke to said, we really miss our sparring partners. Um, and when we do ask to work with the media agency, which we do frequently, um, we're even given email access to someone. What the fuck? Um, or, or we're sent someone so inexperienced or so specialist in one area that they can't contribute to the conversation. So uh, it was, it, in all, it was a pretty g grim view of what was going on in the, in the media world. I'm a massive believer that a good comm strategy can solve all world problems, uh, from politics to Brexit to parenting to your relationships. Trump definitely could do with one. Um, all you have to do is think things through logically, examine the journey, anticipate those hurdles, and focus on the behavior that ultimately we want to change. And yet it's this element that's been watered down by the increasing complexity of media agency models, thanks to their makeup, with a raft of juniors um, and narrow specialists and very few senior generalists um, and that's kind of what I'm trying to put right with with craft so um, before I thought what we might do uh, before I talk through what we might do to fix the industry I thought I'd give you my perspective on what we did to cock it up um, how did we get here uh, and I think we made a few mistakes um, the first that uh, we it was that we tried to make lives in media agencies easier by creating sort of uniform approach to problem solving. So somewhere back in the dim and distant past, some genius said, wouldn't it be better and quicker and, and cheaper if we had a computer uh, that would make decisions easier? Um, and of course, we all know that those, those uh, planning systems are only useful if you've got really good input from a human being and who analyzes the output uh, and gives you some proper insights. Um, but with the intense workload that media agencies are under, unavailability of senior people and the pressure put on agencies to deliver cheap media, you can see how planning systems start to take the place of strategists. Um, we also went into full-on defence of the margin at all costs. I remember sitting in board meetings and being told, at all costs, you deliver that margin. I don't care how you do it, but that's what you're going to deliver at the end of the day. Um, and, and in our defence, I suppose, let's put that into some context, um, we spent the 90s and the noughties, noughties um, uh, with media agencies agreeing 0% commission for new business wins. Right? Just let that sink in, they agreed to not be paid for their service. How fucking awful is that? Not valuing their own input to a, to a client's business. And instead, what the clients allowed to happen was that we'd be, we'd be allowed to make money on the money, basically, on the money that was flowing through, flowing through our books. So that pressure from margin from our holding companies basically forced us all to look elsewhere for a revenue stream, enter the interweb, and uh, programmatic trading desks and margins bigger than our wildest dreams. And all of that, of course, goes back to flipping computer programs again. Um, and then we started to uh, work with clients who really wanted us to deliver a clear ROI immediately. Not six months down the line, not a year down the line, that day. Um, and so, uh, as we all know, you know, optimization can only ever close really small gaps in a business. It really can't be the thing that transforms a business. So we started to overanalyze audience. I don't know about you, but I now rarely see ads serendipitously. Uh, I really only see them if they're meant for me, me, me only. Me with one child living in Sussex with a dog and a rabbit, <laughs> right? They're the sorts of ads that I get to see. I don't just get to come across any advertising anymore. Um, and, and that, I'm really sorry, Google. I'm going to stick the boot in here. But I think we allowed too much of our budgets to go through you, um, Google and Facebook. We're still allowing it. Um, there's no due care and attention of where our advertising is going to appear, uh, to appear. Nice snacks, Google. Again, thanks very much. <laughs> Shit. Um, 
80% of all digital budgets go through Google and, and Facebook, and that's never felt right for me. That, that just feels like the wrong thing to do. So what can we do to fix this? Media, I think, has forgotten that in order to work, you need to take a big strategic leap to get brands noticed, not, not, not create awareness, noticed and demanded and then and only then can you can you start to optimize and in order to make those leaps you need brilliant strategists you don't need computers we need to get back to a point um, where uh, brand media and consumer are working together or thinking about things together it's the intersection of those three things where that magic really happens and i think there are very 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 few places in london at the moment um, that are doing this really well I've, had in, I've heard enough about audiences. I want to talk about people and why they do the things they do, not just where they are and how to reach them. And I want to do that with other people who are as keen as I am to get to the right answer. And that's not always the easy answer. Because with so much media, reaching them is, isn't the problem. Connecting with them, making them notice is the real challenge. And that's arguably a job for context and content rather than channel. And that's not just a media job. That's a comms job. So that's as much your job as it is mine. So uh, we looked for another way. A way where strategy and is valued and paid for. And this will demand a change in the way that we value our service uh, and the way that we're paid by clients. How many senior strategists, and I assume this happens on your side of the fence as, well, as much as it does on mine, how many of you find yourselves on a team sheet with zero cost against your name because you're too expensive to have on there? Uh, the agency knows that actually in reality you're not going to spend much time on that bit of business and the client hopes that he's going to get you for free. <laughs> um, no one wins in this situation. I think that this uh, strategic service that we're moving towards will be project-based, valued on output. I think it will be valued on the difference it makes to the business that we're working with. And um, that because of this, agencies will need to lose their retainers. I've long thought that agency, to, uh, agency retainers are too fat. I think they make us lazy. I think they help. They, they make us put off what we could do today uh, until tomorrow. So we lose the retainers. We work on a project fee. And we create a scope of work with the client that adds value. I think agencies will become leaner, much more leaner than they are at the moment. I think they'll be more consultative. And they will be full of people like you, high level, creative and strategic specialists that cross a range of marketing disciplines. And I think that daily digital performance will be handled by clients in-house, um, so not touched by a media agency at all. Oh. Um, I think we need to lose our egos, take the guns back off each other's lawns and start talking again. I am a really good comm strategist, but I work best when I'm in partnership with a brand and creative strategist. And I'm really OK about that. I'm OK about saying what I'm not good at. So stop pretending that you can do all of the things because you really can't. And by land grabbing, you're just making the problem worse. Collaboration wins the day for me every single time. If I were a network agency, I would be working very hard to deconstruct my business talking to my creative counterparts about plugging strategy um, teams into theirs, not occasionally, but full time. All strategists under one roof coming up with one answer that focuses on people, brands and media. We all of us need to work to the same KPI as the client so that we aren't pulling in different directions. Um, and I'd reconfigure my media agency to make it super efficient, full of smart analysts, to make sure that the brilliant strategy that we're creating is pulled through into media in the best possible way for the client. And I'd make sure that we all got paid well enough to do the job that we've been asked to do with focus and craft. Until that time, Kraft has two senior strategists. We are working our bollocks off at the moment. We've got twice as many, with two strategists only, we've got twice as many as an agency of 70 people. Isn't that ridiculous? Um, so we're trying to bring some art um, back to the craft. And we're trying to take some pride in our work again.
That's it. Did I do that in time? Not bad. I think I've made up some time that guy overran. <laughs> <laughs> Let's have a dig. Um, hello. Uh, I've got to be honest. I think I didn't think this through. These visuals looked fine on my little laptop. It might be a bit overwhelming uh, on a screen this big. Um, so apologies if it induces epilepsy or anything. But the, the reason for the visuals is um, I thought this was a good parallel. It seemed like a good idea at the time. So the history of the art industry has primarily followed the same form in that it's paint on canvas. People have expressed themselves differently, obviously, through the, through the centuries, but fundamentally it's that form. But this artist, French guy, Thomas Thomas Blanchard, tried to do something different and use paint and the movement of paint as the art itself. I thought that was an interesting parallel, trying to do something different. It sounds pretentious now I say it out loud, but hey, I'm a planner. Planners are pretentious. It's also post-rationalized, if I'm honest, which is also a plannery thing to do, because uh, <laughs> um, the truth is, I, I thought I just needed some distracting visuals, because I'm going to be talking about agency remuneration, which is pretty dry, so I thought distract with some visuals. So um, I'm going to come on to talk about some strategy things, some quite specific things that may or may not be useful, I don't know. Um, but also start off with some agency things about anomaly. And I apologize a little bit, because I don't mean it to sound too silly, but um, the APG did ask me to say a few of these things, because the reason I'm here is definitely not for me. It's not that I've got anything particularly interesting to say. It's just that anomaly is a, and the model of anomaly was formed really as a reaction to a changing industry. So some of those principles might be interesting. Um, so that's what this is. So the first uh, section really is on some agency principles. And the first one, how exciting is this? I'm going to talk about timesheets. Um, <laughs> bet you're glad you came. Um, uh, and the thing about timesheets is uh, we don't do timesheets. We've never done timesheets, which is nice in and of itself because they're boring and everyone makes timesheets up. It's, everyone knows it's a nonsense. Um, but it's not about that. It's about not charging by time. So we were founded on a principle of not charging by time, which most of the industry does. And instead, we charge a value-based fee and then try and put all of our, or at least a disproportionate amount of our profit at risk against success metrics in some ways. Now, not every agency can do that, but I think every agency can and should put a disproportionate amount of their fee or their revenue into some kind of performance because it forces, I think, really exciting behavior for agencies and, um, and individual strategies. But I do think charging by time is, the wrong thing to do anyway, because it incentivizes you to take longer, put more people on it, which isn't in the client's interest. So we were founded on a different principle. But, so, but the bigger thing really is trying to put more into performance and really being accountable uh, to, to the effectiveness of what you do in various ways. And I can talk about the detail of that if anyone's interested. But I think one of the things that it is exciting, the ramification that's exciting is, and you talked about good questions, Matt, in your intro, it really forces a strategist or an agency to really ask a question about the question you've been asked. If you're not going to get paid, if you're not going to make your margin, if what you do doesn't work, it really forces you to think, is this the right question? Do I need to reframe this business challenge in a way that actually is going to be the right thing for the client? So that's, a, that's an exciting thing. So it pushes you upstream a little bit to ask those bigger questions and make sure you're really interrogating, is it a good question? Which is exciting, I think, for strategists. The second thing I think it forces is um, a more open attitude to creativity, which I think has two components to it. One is it means you can't be biased towards any particular channel or solution. If you're, again, if you're not going to make your margin, if you're not going to make your highest return on investment for the agency, uh, if it doesn't work, it means you, are, you can't be biased towards a thing that you think is more exciting. Or is, you can only be biased to what is right, what you think is right, what you think is going to be the most interesting thing. And that doesn't mean you're less creative. On the contrary, I think it just means you have a more open attitude to what a creative idea is. So uh, it might be... Um, <coughs> Paul Smith stripes, that's a creative idea. Yes, advertising is a creative idea. Um, we didn't do this, but Amazon, you know, if, if you, people who bought this bought this, that's an amazing creative idea. And so uh, structuring yourself in a way that you're incentivized by success, I think, forces you to think and have the opportunity to think about what a creative idea is more broadly. It doesn't make you any less creative. I just think it broadens the nature of what a creative idea might be, which again, I think is exciting for, for, for any agency and certainly for a strategist within it. It also means culturally, and Sally talked about collaboration being key, it means you have 
to be more collaborative. And every agency talks about collaboration and how we're all collaborative, great. But the reality is we're not always. But if you have a system and a, and a kind of financial model where um, the right answer might be uh, just a media partnership, but that often is the case. The right answer might be to do nothing. It's unlikely, but that might be the right answer. Um, or at least to take the previous agency's work and change it slightly, which most creative agencies probably wouldn't think of as a, an opportunity. But if you're incentivized that way, what that means is it could be a junior comm strategist has the idea because they might say, actually, put all the money, all the money into sponsoring this thing. And what you have to have in that context is a, like senior creatives, the ECD has to go, yeah, that probably is the right thing. So you can't have ego. So the money forces all this behavior. And whether or not you can be in an agency that doesn't charge by time or not, if you can be in an agency that really or try and push for your clients to put more into performance-related bonuses, it forces all this, I think, really exciting behavior and keeps us honest. Um, the next thing is anomaly. Um, we create and own our own IP. And that's not because we think we'll get rich on it. And we don't do much of it. And by that, I don't mean um, like just backing people's hobbies. I mean actual product innovation. And the value of that is not because we're going to get rich, because we only do it once or twice now. We've learned over the years the hard way. You don't compete with China on manufacturing and venture capitals. Sharks, lawyers are going to crush you in an instant. So we, but we do one or two of them just so we understand what it means to develop product. And we, we can apply that elsewhere. Um, so at the moment, we have um, the main one we have is a medical marijuana product. So we designed it. We um, obviously didn't do the science of it, but uh, it's doing incredibly well in America. It's positioned as a wellness brand. And the, but the point of it is it forces us to understand what it means to wh where you put a product on shelf. That kind of stuff is forced. That kind of behavior is forced when you develop your own product. And the final thing um, is having a global P&L, I think, is incredibly useful. And it, again, comes back to if you're not charging people by time, you can have uh, a global PL and not local PLs, it means that you can kind of move people around uh, intellectually and strategists can get involved in different projects, um, which is really useful to us. Um, and, and I think it just means that if your answer can be anything, it means that you don't have to have everything in every single office. We've got seven offices, but spread across those seven, we do have specialisms. And not having a local PL means you just don't have that bullshit that you have in micro networks where everyone's fighting for a bit and you can genuinely swap intellectual capital and make it fluid. So that is, um, has, has the, has the people at the front must be struggling with the visuals. That's what I'm, I'm particularly worried, worried about. Um, if anyone's pregnant, I'm a bit worried about that. <laughs> Maybe leave the room. Um, so coming on to the strategy things, um, and I've got two and a bit minutes left for this. So the first observation is I would encourage people to work somewhere open. And I don't necessarily mean move agency. Although if, if, if you do move agency, I would encourage you to really interrogate is the environment there going to be open for a strategist? Are you genuinely going to have a collaborative opportunity with the creatives? And of course, in an interview, people will say that that's the case. But do everything you can to find out if that's true. Will it be open? Is, the, is it truly collaborative? As a strategist, will I get to think broadly? Can briefs be opened out to something bigger? But it doesn't mean move to another agency necessarily. It might mean move to a group within your existing agency where there's more of that, or even to an account where it is just more open and it's more collaborative and the opportunities are broader for a strategist. So I'd say that. Second thing I'd say is delay the brief. Um, excuse me. Um, we have a thing anomaly called anomalous sessions, which means when a client brief comes in, because you know what it's like. Client brief comes in, there's always a pressure to get that brief into the creative department as quickly as possible. But much better if you can, and I realize this is naive, and you can't always do this, obviously, but where possible, having a bit of time where you get everyone senior around a table and just go, before you write the brief, what is the sort of answer? What shape of answer might be right here? Maybe we don't need the creative department. Maybe it's actually some sort of consultancy thing first. Just taking a pause and genuinely thinking in the most open way possible before you decide to brief the creative department and assume that the, the creative department is going to crack it. Maybe it's a media part, whatever it might be. So I think that's, again, not everyone can do that. But if you can, I think that's incredibly helpful to create the kind of ideas and the kind of work that I think increasingly the industry might be looking for. Um, the next thing, and, and Sally, you might have to put earmuffs on for this because I totally agree with everything you, you said about the importance of the comms model. And I would encourage everybody, whatever sort of strategist you are, 
is to try and own that comms model. And I'm not trying to take business away from you. But if, you, if you're not owning that, you're really missing out. Because what I've noticed in recent years is the value of, because you know it's like in the old days, uh, agencies would, you do the big brand idea bit in a presentation. And then you do the big exciting creative idea bit. And then it'd be the media bit. And the media bit, sometimes you run out of time or it's tagged on at the end. Um, but the reality is increasingly, I'm, we're seeing value from actually putting that up the front. And I don't mean detailed media plans. I mean the comms principles, the comms approach, the go-to-market approach. Actually, that's the reality of what most clients are interested in. That's where the money is. That's the, that's the, that's the kind of harder working stuff. And then put creative and ideas into that. But I think any good strategist should want to own that because there's creativity in that. And I don't mean detail. I just mean sort of a broad kind of go-to-market. And we want business just on that. We have, the work's been shit, frankly, and the, the, some of that, but just the kind of smartness of this is the reality of how this thinking is going to play out. So I'd encourage everybody to try and do that and own that. The next thing, um, and I've just run out of time, so I'm at the end and I'm now not starting, thankfully, in my presentation, but a couple of minutes, I've only got what, two left. Uh, start at the end. So in a world where programmatic is increasingly important and performance marketing, I think there's, there's an opportunity for strategists to think at the end of the process and work back strategically. The AIDA model that's been around since 1904, um, awareness, interest, decision, action, whatever it is, um, you know, is great. And I'm not saying that's wrong, but you know, 1904. Uh, the industry has changed a lot since then. So I wouldn't say don't think in those terms, but I think there's value in starting at the end as another way of thinking about it and thinking about, all right, so at the moment at which our comms are handing over to transaction, to purchase, whatever it is, start there. Think about that. Really sweat those details. What are the insights into the, what the consumer is thinking at that point? What is the exact call to action that we should have that's really going to prompt action that's going to prompt um, transactional purchase. We don't really, it's an afterthought for us typically. But if we think there, that's really helpful because then we go, right, what's the perfect call to action? Right now, what is the brand meaning that we put into that call to action? And you sort of work backwards. We have found success by doing that. And it's not necessarily to replace doing it the other way. But it's, it's a kind of, it's a way of thinking about it. So you're from the start thinking about action, thinking about performance, which is the way the industry is going. And the final point, which is a different type of thought, is don't work five days. And uh, I don't mean work six or seven. <laughs> I mean uh, work, I, I'm very proud of the fact that we have both at an agency level, but also in the department, I think eight out of the 12 strategists I've got work three or four days at Anomaly and do other things on the, on, on the side. And I think increasingly we're in an industry where it's hard to attract talent. And so I think that is a big thing going forward. I think we have to think more flexibly and openly about what people want to do with their lives. And it's a value to the agency. We wouldn't get these people otherwise. But also when those people are there for those three or four days, they're really on it. And they do other things that they bring in. So I would encourage all of you, if you're at a stage where you can, is to not give yourself to one agency. It's too late for me. I'm old. I've got three kids and a mortgage, and I need the money. So I do five days. But for the rest of you, I would not if you can. So that is me. Thank you. Hello. Uh, OK, so um, I hope you've had a, a glass of wine or something, because uh, my presentation is, it goes off on a bit of a tangent. Um, but uh, that's okay. You like tangents, right? Um, so um, I'll tell you a bit about me so, so you understand why I'm talking about writing. So, so my background is as a strategist in, in ad agencies. I did that for, for many years. Um, and then uh, I had a kind of midlife crisis, slightly premature midlife crisis, which I recommend, by the way, get your midlife crisis in early and then, and then often. Um, and, and I sort of reassessed what, what I wanted to do. Um, and I thought I've always wanted to, to uh, I've always liked writing, and maybe I can launch a writing career of some kind. Uh, it's kind of now or never. Um, and so, uh, so I've now uh, published uh, two or three books. Um, and I write for, uh, and I do, so I write sort of non-fiction books about human behavior. Um, I'll show you a couple in a minute. Um, and I write journalism for the FT and for, uh, and for Wired and The Economist about things that interest me, basically. Um, so I'm in quite a good position from, from in, in, in that point of view. I can actually just choose what I want to write about. Um, and somewhere in the middle, uh, they, they, they kind of overlap. 
Um, so I wanted to talk about why um, you should write. <laughs> um, not necessarily professionally, but 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 why not? Um, and just so why I think so so why I think writing is useful. So I want to start by saying I don't think the industry is actually broken, and I, I'm almost tempted to just do my talk about that. Um, uh, but that would just be unnecessarily uh, argumentative. Um, and okay, I don't think it's broken. However, this guy makes a good point. Uh, after he's introduced uh, this news from Netflix, right at the bottom here, he says, yeah, maybe we should all quit our jobs and write for Netflix. So Netflix are making 700 new shows in 2018. I mean, this is an astonishing amount of, uh, of, of shows, astonishing demand for content, right? And you know, Netflix are not the only players in this area, you know, right? So. In TV, in movies, there's an incredible demand for stories, for content, for IP. Um, and so, if you are, uh, you know, you're in this industry, right? So you, you think you are sort of some creative, right? You like to think creatively. Um, and my sort of friendly challenge to you tonight is: is why not cre create something at some point, either now or, or, or think about it, um, and actually try and sell it in the marketplace, because I think it will be good for you, it'll be a great challenge for you, and I just think it will make you a better person, which is what I'm going to talk about. But I, I'm going to focus specifically on writing. Now, I don't write um, uh, uh, fiction, I write um, uh, books about human behavior. Um, yeah, so I wrote a book about lying, which were, got, got reissued with this, uh, became suddenly very current over the last year and a half, um, got reissued with that, with that cover, um, and a book about the, the power of um, curiosity. Um, and, and I write sort of long form um, journalism, so I write kind of long reads for, for, for various publications. Um, and although I don't write fiction, the fact is there's a lot of merging going on at the moment because of this incredible demand for stories. So I'm talking to TV companies at the moment about um, uh, doing a dramatic um, adaptation of, of one of my uh, pieces for The Guardian last year. Um, that thing is kind of happening a lot, right? So, so stories are kind of jumping from one, one arena to the other. So it's another kind of incentive to think, well, hang on, maybe I should actually create some content myself. And I just think, you know, having, creating content yourself is, I, I guess, the kind of uh, uh, the message that, I'm, that I'm, I want you to take away. I'm going to talk specifically about writing, though, about actual kind of like longhand writing. Well, not necessarily with a quill, but, but um, uh, words <laughs> um, and, and paragraphs. Um, and why I think writing sentences and paragraphs um, is, is good for, you, for the work that you're doing now and is good for, for any kind of future work you do. And it's just good for you as a person. So five things I've learned about communication, creativity, and life from writing. I mean, this could be a book, right? This could be a self-help book. Um, so one, writing makes you smarter. Um, I actually feel like I, I've got smarter since I, since I really started taking writing seriously. And you might say, OK, well, you know, you're starting from a low bar. But um, whoever you are, you know, if, if you're starting from a high bar, I think you can actually get smarter by really, really forcing yourself to, to write and get better at writing. Because writing is a form of thinking. Um, this is, people have, have said various, any writer has no, understands this intuitively. And in fact, you know, if you've done some writing, you'll, I think you'll get this as well, just even in the act of writing a brief or writing a, a, a sort of an email to a client. I write to find out what I'm thinking, right? So your kind of conventional idea of what's ha what happens when you write something is you have this kind of pre-verbal stuff in your head, which you then just translate into, into language, into words. That's not actually how it works. And, and writing forces you right up against the reality of how it works, which is as you're writing, the writing kind of forms your, your thinking. Um, it makes it uh, clearer, for one thing. It absolutely kind of makes... Uh, uh, co-weight what was in co-weight, right? So this kind of mess of stuff you have in your head, you are forced to, to put down on the page. 
and it's really painful, right? It's really, really hard work. Um, one of my favorite quotes about writing is uh, from the, the novelist William Mann, who said, uh, a writer is somebody for whom writing is more difficult than most people, right? A, a, a writer is someone who really, really sweats over the sentences and the words and knows how hard it is to, to, to get it right. But in getting it right, um, I think you improve your thinking and improve your ideas. Um, and this is connected to this, this second thought, which is, it, it's, a, it's like a sort of regular reminder that there isn't this kind of idea, this creative idea out there, and then there's the execution of it. The, the execution and the idea are always woven together. Um, there's a great quote from, from Steve Jobs, which is, in, uh, which is in Curious, and of course you can Google it, I have to say that, um, uh, where he talks about what happened when he came, when he left Apple and John Scully took over um, and how Apple went wrong in the, the kind of dark years of Apple. Um, he says, after I left, Apple got a very serious disease, the disease of thinking that a really great idea is 90% of the work. And that if you just tell everyone, here's this great idea, then they can just go off and make it happen. And he goes on to say, because I've sort of chopped off a bit, um, it's fitting 5,000 things together and, and every time you try and fix that, something, something else goes wrong over here, and then you have to fit that. He's talking about the process of you know, creating uh, 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 technology. The same thing is true of writing. If you've ever written a kind of fairly kind of lengthy piece, it's all about kind of putting details together and making that. And every time you kind of fix that paragraph, then you, that, that means you have to go back there, and you're constantly thinking, well, what's the real kind of thinking and theme and idea un, un, underneath here? And that is how the magic happens. So at the end of the day, when you get a kind of great idea and a great kind of piece, um, uh, a great uh, a piece of technology, that's how it happens. It doesn't come from somebody saying, oh, here's an idea, now you can just go away and execute it. And I think that's a, a kind of um, a fallacy that we are particularly prone to in this industry. We kind of think, there's the idea up here, and then some people kind of just, just do it. Um, and it doesn't work like that. Um, and one of the biggest things I've learned from, from doing a lot of writing is to stop worrying about um, originality and being the first person to, to say something. And it's given me a more sophisticated idea, actually, of how um, creativity works. So again and again, um, I've thought about an idea for, for a book or a piece. And then I thought, well, yeah, but somebody has said that already. Well, somebody's done that. Um, and then, for whatever, you know, I do it anyway. And in the act of doing it, the, original, the originality becomes apparent because, okay, somebody might have said this or done this or th written about this, but when it's filtered through me, through my sensibility, my sort of unique prism, and this is true of everyone, right? Everybody is, has a unique kind of set of uh, experiences and knowledge and personality. Then it comes out as something original. <laughs> So um, I, I read a piece for the Financial Times called How the Mad Men Lost the Plot um, a couple of years ago. And it was very, um, very successful. Lots of people read it and went kind of crazy um, viral. Um, and there was nothing particularly original in it. Um, I, and, and when I was writing, I was thinking, I'm really just saying stuff that people have said already right, in various places. So I did, uh, but you get through that stage, and by the time it got out there, it, kind of, it had been sort of filtered through me, through me and my kind of way of doing things and my kind of way of thinking, and it came out and it felt you know, reasonably, reasonably fresh. Um, I sometimes think about this as the rubber soul effect. Um, so when the Beatles were recording Rubber Soul, the album they made in 1965, they were li listening to a lot of Motown. Um, they were really into, into, into black soul, black American soul. And they felt, I think, slightly um, apologetic about it. They, they, I think they felt like, oh, it looks like we're just sort of copying um, Motown here, so we'll make this kind of little joke about it in the title, Rubber Soul. Now, I'm a huge Beatles fan. I love this album. Um, I'm also a huge uh, Motown album and a big sort of soul fan. This album sounds nothing like Motown. <laughs> sounds nothing like American Soul. I mean, actually, if you listen to it, you can kind of hear the influences. But they, they had taken their influences, and they'd, they'd been filtered through the most kind of amazing uh, uh, ecosystem of, of, uh, of creativity uh, you know, ever, <laughs> perhaps. You know, the, the, the four of them called uh, the Beatles. Um, and by the time it came through the Beatles, it sounded like 
something absolutely kind of groundbreaking and, and radical. So, so when I'm thinking, oh, is this original? I sometimes think, don't, don't worry, it'll be, it'll be um, one of the great creative breakthroughs of all time. <laughs> um, and uh, a fourth one is let the idea lead you. What I mean by this is like, if you're a planner, particularly a strategist, you often think quite logically about the creative process, right? That's kind of your uh, natural predisposition. And we sometimes find it hard to say, but hang on, there's this kind of really sexy, cool um, idea, line, image, or whatever it is. Maybe we should kind of just, just work around that. Some, actually, you know, we, we do kind of end up post-rationalizing things, but we don't, we don't particularly like it. And I just think the more kind of writing or the kind of con content creation you do, the more you find that happening, and the more you kind of respect that process of saying, OK, I worked out how to make this thing work. Even though I didn't understand why it was cool in the first place, I've now worked out why it was cool, and I've kind of worked my, my piece around it. Um, what made me think about this recently was, was um, listening to a, a talk by an American writer not, the talk was not given by J.D. Salinger, by the way. That would be pretty cool if I, if I found a secret YouTube tape of him talking. Um, it was given by uh, Dennis Johnson, who wrote uh, a, a great collection of short stories called Jesus, Jesus' Son, um, which I strongly recommend. It'll blow your minds. Um, brilliant writer. He, he died uh, a couple of years ago. And as an aside in this piece, he, he's, he, uh, sorry, he was giving a talk to students about creative writing. And he said, oh, my, and my latest um, uh, uh, story is called, I think it was called Triumph Over the Grave. And he said, to be honest, I came up with the title first. And then I kind of worked out a way of telling a story around it. And he said, I think that's what J.D. Salinger did with Catcher in the Rye. <laughs> he said, if you think about it, Catcher in the Rye, you know, that, that metaphor at the end of, of uh, uh, Holton Caulfield kind of stopping kids from running off the edge of a cliff in, in a wheat field. He said, that's really lame, isn't it? <laughs> he said, think about it, you know, it's the most kind of like on the nose kind of like clunky metaphor you can imagine. Um, and my, I, my strong suspicion is that Salon just, just was writing this book and just woke up with one morning with this beautiful phrase in his head, catch her in the rye, and thought, that's a great title. That's a great title. OK, how can I make this work? <laughs> Shoved in this metaphor at the end. OK, so um, this is the last one. Um, and, and I think this is probably the most important. And uh, it's important to your, your, your creative endeavors. And it's important to your work. And, and actually, it's just important to uh, life, or at least I, I have found it that way. I've got a lot better since I started writing at um, distinguishing between the noise and the signal when it comes to my assessment of how I'm doing, of how good I am, and of how good a piece is. Um, so there's a, a, a kind of clip in a film called Hearts of Darkness, which is a documentary about the making of Apocalypse Now. Again, strongly recommend you go and watch it. It's an absolutely amazing story in many ways, but it's, and it's a great example of somebody uh, being incredibly creative under pressure. So Francis Ford Coppola, um, right in the, in the middle of this movie, he's in the middle of the jungle shooting this, this film. And there's just a scene in it where, because they have a terribly kind of chaotic time making it, where he is talking to, to somebody he's working with, and he says, do you know what, I'm just, I just pretty sure now that this film is not going to be very good. Um, and he wasn't saying it, and he wasn't kind of throwing a tantrum. He wasn't kind of highly emotional. What, what's, what struck me about it was that it was quite a cool, seemed like quite a cool, rational assessment of where he thought. He had a lot of rushes now. I've been looking at the film. He's like, yeah, I, 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 this is not where I wanted to be. I'm pretty sure this is going to be a bad film. I mean, uh, that's sad, but, but, but that's where we are. So now it's voted like the best film of all time, or it's in the top two or three, pretty much every poll of, of film. It's an astonishingly great film. So he was so sort of vastly wrong about assessing how, how, how good it was. So sometimes when I'm you know, think in the middle of a, a book or, or, or any kind of piece, um, or, or a radio, so I write, I've written sort of radio comedy for, for, for Radio 4, any sort of creative piece, and I'm thinking, this is terrible. Then I think about that clip of Francis Ford Coppola. Um, I'm not saying, by the way, that my, my, like my piece about Financial Times, Mad Men, is, is uh, on the same level of apocalypse now, but in some ways it had sort of similar themes. Um, <laughs> and uh, uh, I, I've just sort of learned to, to um, distinguish between um, emotional weather and emotional climate. 
um, is one way of thinking about it. And this is why it's sort of applicable to life and not just work. Um, so, so there are days when, I, when I've written something and I think, this is absolutely fantastic. And then I come back to it and the next day I'm like, well, it's mediocre at best. There are other days when I think, this is absolutely terrible. And I come back to it a week later and I go, mm, oh, I could use this. Um, and I've learned just not to trust my instant. That's why I say not right now. Right? So trust your talent and trust your unique sensibility and, and trust your, your vision, but, but don't necessarily trust what you're thinking about it right now. Um, that's more like the weather and trust in kind of long-term climate trends. Oh, no, we're back to apocalypse now. Um, uh, but that, and that is you know, also a way to think about, I, I find, your emotional <laughs> fluctuations. So when I'm feeling down now, and this is partly something that I have got better at because of writing, if, I, if I'm feeling down, I'm much better at saying, well, okay, you're feeling down now, but the overall picture is quite good, um, and you'll be back up again at some point in a couple of weeks. So just be down, that's fine. Um, and so you just learn to deal with this, the, the kind of the ups, and I'm not saying I'm bipolar, by the way, I think I'm freely kind of normal temperament, but everyone goes, kind of goes up and down a bit, and you just learn to, to, to distinguish between the short-term fluctuations and, and the long-term trends. So. I think I've said all I'm going to say. Um, I hope you're all going to go home and, and start writing. Thank you very much. Thank you.